On this episode of Radcast Outdoors, we sit down with Mr. Blake Fegler. Blake is the owner of 307 Pursuit Outdoors. You can find them at, at 307 Pursuit on Facebook. He does a lot of work raising money to do Hunt with Hero programs and to take young children with life threatening illnesses hunting. Blake is an amazing guy. He does a lot of guiding. He's also a farmer and rancher here in Wyoming, and he's been hunting for most of his life. We sit down and we pick his brain about different perspectives about hunting and fishing, and he also fills us in on some of the great organizations that he works with, including the Mealy Fanatic Foundation, Holy Pursuit Dream Foundation, and Hunt with Heroes Wyoming. So we hope that you'll sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode number 50 of Radcast Outdoors. This episode of Radcast Outdoors is brought to you by PK Lures, Bow Spider, and High Mountain Seasonings. Fish on! Hey, Radcast is on! Hunting, fishing, and everything in between. This is Radcast Outdoors. Here are David Merrill and Patrick Edwards. Radcast is back. We're back in the studio. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm super excited to announce that we are in our new studio for the first episode ever. We'll have some photos coming soon. So (laughs) it's not quite finished, but we are in. We're here. This is at Bow Spider and it's the Radcast Outdoor Studio. So it's an exciting day for us. And today we have a Mr. Blake Fegler with us. He's back again. Say hello, Blake. I'm back again. I'm surprised I'm welcome back again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'm excited to have you back. Well, I'm I'm happy to be here. And so thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming in. Yeah, it's it's been a little while. We had Jacob in here. Um, well, Jacob and his dad on the phone, and we were talking about yep. that big muley buck that you guys went and got this last year. And I was like, you know, we really need to have Blake back in to talk about the stuff that you do on a regular basis and, right. and some of that. So for those who didn't listen to that episode, if you want to go back and hear a really, really good story. That was a good one. Go back, listen to the episode with Jacob. I think it was episode 32 or 33, somewhere in there. Um, go check that one out. Uh, he was a leukemia survivor. Great kid from the Carolinas, right? Yep, South Carolina. Yep. And so go listen to that. But tell us a little bit, Blake, about yourself and 307 Pursuit. Okay, well, I was born and raised here in central Wyoming, grew up in agriculture, farming, and in the cattle industry. And, uh, you know, with that, it also led me into the hunting part of the world, too. You know, irrigating hay fields, you'd always have (laughs) antelope and mule deer around. So we were kind of spoiled having the private ground access to start off. But, I mean, shoot, I remember I was probably anywhere from 8 to 10 years old. I would get a four-wheeler and, you know, would go scouting for antelope and I'd take a journal. I felt like the Eastman's and I would, (laughs) would, you know, doodle and draw antelope and I would name them all at eight years old and I would scout all summer long. Looking back, my dad was not impressed because I'd put (laughs) 2,000 miles on a four-wheeler over the summer. But yeah, I mean, I mean, my passion for the outdoors has always been there and I've just always grown up in the outdoors. So, and I'm still in the farming and cattle industry today. But uh, I also started 307 Pursuit um, right out of high school, really. I had the dream in high school, but I started it right as I turned 18 and graduated. And um, it's kind of changed paces on what my end goals kind of been with the business. But right now it is a um, nonprofit business that our main goal is to sell merchandise as far as Wyoming gear and apparel, like hats and sweatshirts. And we take that money And we either partner with different foundations or we take that money and we take kids with life-threatening illnesses, hunting, or wounded veterans. That's an amazing deal. And so I know on Facebook, I follow 307 Pursuit, but how do people find it besides that? um, All your social media platforms is the the best way to get a hold of us right now. Um, My phone number is on there. My email address is on there. And... uh, yeah, like I said, we just partner with a bunch of different foundations and businesses, and we make a lot of hunts happen each year, and we're just we're expanding. That's what's been really neat with our 
po- little podcast right now and being able to pair with some of our sponsors. I mean, PK Lures being one of those. It's just some phenomenal companies in the industry that we get to work with. Yep. So um, one of the things about that, I mean, we'll talk about PK Lures just for a little bit because they are one of the sponsors of this podcast. I know from working with them for years and years, they do a lot of big donations to like cast for kids and other things like that to get people involved in fishing. And I know that's really kind of the heart behind what you're trying to do. You're trying to help wounded vets and, you know, people who've overcome illness and different things get out in the field. Um, But yeah, for our listeners, go out and support organizations like this support companies that support these kind of things. So pklure.com is where you can go to support them right now. They do have a really good uh, offer for our listeners. It's exclusive to us. So if you put rad in on your checkout and you buy one of their spoon kits, so they have two different spoon kits that you can buy. Um, I, I like them both. I think they both have (laughs) good application. And if you don't believe me, go check out our recent Facebook posts of some of the fish I caught on some of their spoons. But, you know, um, you, if you buy one of those spoon kits, you put in the code rad at checkout, you get a free set of Wyoming blades. They add some flash and attraction to your lure. That's a good way to go. Um, you can do that at pklure.com. So, so did you do much fishing growing up? Oh man, farming was right in the heart of summer. So obviously, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, we tried to do some ice fishing here and there, but mostly, again, then you'd have cows. We'd feed cows all summer or all winter growing up. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the the great part about growing up in the outdoors is you know you're outdoors and you got to see wildlife and you know you'd have some free time and not a set schedule, but at the same time it would. Uh, hinder a lot of things too and take up a lot of your time but thankfully where we're at right now and how we're set up uh, come fall time i can sneak away quite a bit so (laughs) and that's good that is important you need some time to get away yeah who got you into the hunting side was it your dad or yeah i would say my biggest influencer would be my dad um uh, growing up, he's probably the only one I would always really go hunting with each fall. And it was always because I would beg him to go. He was always busy, like, got to do this and this and this. But uh, he was always uh, there to say, all right, let's 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 go out and shoot an antelope today. Or let's go deer hunting today. Let's go coyote hunting today, whatever it may be. So, I mean, he definitely paved the way and got me started. And then from there on, it was kind of just a solo mission. Like I said, at eight years old, I was doing my own scouting from a four-wheeler, but... And, you know, from people in the non-farming communities that don't don't really understand, if you're doing your own hay and you're doing your own cattle, there isn't a day off there's all no year. Time, no. There's no free time. No, so. There's always a project and there's always something new to do. Explain what that's like seasonally. I mean, for the because we do have people that listen to this that have no idea about farming and ranching. So explain, like, what's spring look like? What's summer look like? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I wish you could paint a book and say this is what today's going to be like (laughs) and it follows that path but that's not it but uh springtime's full of usually calving from march april sometimes february and then you're just getting ground ready to plant so plowing power herring leveling putting fertilizer down um building (laughs) building pivots like you're doing right now (laughs) when mother nature allows i mean you're in the field getting everything done you're just playing tight windows and you know, planting beans and around May 20th, planting barley April 1st. You kind of have a set schedule, but it's all up in the air with Mother Nature. Mm-hmm. Then summer, you know, with where we're at, it's all irrigated. So it's we don't rely on Mother Nature to grow the crops once we get them in the ground. So where we're at, we have to either flood, irrigate, or, you know, pivot or any kind of sprinkler system. So... Um, every day, it's kind of like feeding cows every day in the winter. Irrigating is every day, morning and night, <laughs> no matter <laughs> if you want to go to a concert or whatever it may be, you got to irrigate first or after or whatever it may be. So you're tied up every day. And then in the fall, you're harvesting your crops, whether it be beans, corn, and unlike other crops, hay, you're doing at least three times a year. So <laughs> 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 Wonderful. <laughs> We have a listener that told me a pretty good story about irrigation. He said in high school, it was his job to, you know, dad had maybe 40 acres or so to irrigate. 
after school he was supposed to go change and he didn't one night right for whatever reason (laughs) his dad worked a graveyard shift and came in and woke him up about two and said hey I drove by the field down there on shift and noticed the the waters had been changed couldn't go change it and he got up and started doing it and when he got back he thought about he's like if he drove down there, he could have changed it and let me sleep. <laughs> He's like, yeah, but you wouldn't have learned your lesson, yeah, would you? you wouldn't have learned your lesson. Yep. Yeah. And then wintertime, you got to feed those oh, cattle. Pretty much. <laughs> and do other projects. And, and again, if Mother Nature would play along with your role, you could leave them out there <laughs> and not feed them in November, December. But usually we get a snowstorm in November and then it gets cold and then that snow stays all year round. So they're digging through frozen snow to get to feed. So you end up having to pretty much feed them all winter. So So if you're from a city (laughs) and you're like, man, I would love to be a rancher after listening to that, you may be (laughs) deciding that maybe not. It's a lot of work, but it is, like you said, you have the benefit of being outside, which is good. Yeah, it is rewarding. I mean, it's like hunting we all do it for our own specific reasons and you know with hunting you think uh, as an outsider you might look at hunting and say well they only want to kill animals but now that's obviously not obviously why we do it it's being outdoors just being with family uh harvesting is just such the small aspect of it and same thing with you know the agriculture thing and you know it's not just about the paycheck or having time off or not time off it's <laughs> it's about being outside and you know family traditions and there's a connection to the land in both there's a similarity oh, yeah. i see whether you're around hunting camp right where it's hey who got one today and some camps you go to nobody gets anything yep. for years on end and they the, the they group still, still come yep. and still look forward to doing that right same thing in farming families you see that it's you know, it's a team effort, and some years it's not a good good season. Just doesn't, you know, you get wildfires and droughts. Oh, yeah. and, and then you didn't mention fencing. <laughs> <laughs> what season do What's you do that? fencing? Oh. <laughs> What's fencing? Oh, those are usually the projects that are you think are at the top of the list, but they get moved down to the bottom until something's out or something's broken, and then, <laughs> then it's a priority. <laughs> Yeah, if the cows are out, that's a bad deal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, we had nine cows on my place a couple different times, and they were usually on the neighbors more than mine. <laughs> so we no longer have cows, and we have all new fences on this property. And that helps. That we still have cows coming on. <laughs> because the neighbors aren't feeding theirs enough, so the They're cows are still over. coming over here now. Yep. That's the thing about cows. They go where the food is. And, and they don't mind walking through a fence, that's for sure. So, so, Blake, did you have a mentor to get into the big game aspect of hunting? You know, you mentioned your dad's like, yeah, we'll go, you know, right. periodically. But when you really kind of got into, hey, I want to tackle this big game, was there a mentor? Was there somebody you reached out or was it just, go, go ahead. I, I mean, I had a lot of influencers in my life, a lot of, uh, whether it be a grandparents or great uncles or um i have a guy that i call my grandpa but he's not related at all he's just been part of the family ever since i was born and he's been there done that and we actually just celebrated his 90th birthday today and he's still hunting today i mean he killed shoot i think three antelope and three deer last year and went elk hunting didn't get an elk but i mean at 90 years old and this year again he's putting in for bison and it's like (laughs) he will never quit and i mean i think that's what keeps him going is you know he doesn't quit and he's chopping wood and taking care of a garden every day and uh that that's a guy i definitely look up to in the the hunting aspect of things i mean he's been to alaska multiple times and he's like i said he's been there done that he's killed more than three moose i think um but but as far as a mentor, no, it's just been, you know, I, I've seen people do certain things, whether it be like guys like him or the outdoor channel growing up as kids, like, I want to do that. And it's just been trial and error and uh, just having the hopes and dreams of one day, maybe I'll do that. And sometimes they just play out unexpectedly. So I wouldn't say I've had a, a, a mentor that it's, you know, helped me along the way into the big game aspect but uh yeah it's just been like i said trial and error and just figuring things out on my on my own which i mean (laughs) it might not save time but you learn you learn a lot Mm -hmm. so you know i can remember one of my very first deer hunts was as a teenager i didn't even get to have a gun or a tag but i got to go along and 
you know, that first, that, that night I didn't sleep. I, I, not a wink. I was just so excited. Right. And then out hunting, I, I was sleeping under every tree we stopped at. <laughs> but do you have a memory, you know, that, cause I'm continually chasing that first high of even getting to go. Right. Oh yeah. You know, and it's, I've talked to a couple guys that are starting their first elk hunt like this year. And I said, I, I told them I'm jealous of you. Right. Because now I got 20 years of elk hunting under my belt and it's, I wouldn't say it's routine, but I, I kind of can expect what's right. going to happen. Right. And I I still get excited. I'm still amped, but I can sleep the night before, right? Mm-hmm. Now, I'm I'm up early. I'm ready to go way, way earlier than if it'd be work or anything else. But do you have a favorite memory as a kid? You know, something like that. Right. Oh, man. And that's, I mean, that's anymore why I, uh, I shoot so high with my goals now is because it always feels like you're wanting to chase that excitement as you had when you're first starting and not to say that hunting gets old or like you were saying but it does kind of get into a routine or you know you're expected you've been in those situations before so you're always wanting to do new and better things and we'll touch on that later but uh oh man I remember a, a nasty rainstorm right before dark one time my dad took me uh antelope hunting and it was like I said it was getting dark and we were belly crawling on this group of antelope and it just started pouring down rain <laughs> conditions that I mean you wouldn't have been in there unless you were my age anyway so my dad kept going <laughs> for an antelope <laughs> and uh one you could have come back tomorrow <laughs> when the sun was out yeah harvested the same it one. wasn't raining yeah but and that's kind of I mean we talked about that episode uh with Jacob one thing that makes that so memorable is the nasty weather <laughs> mm-hmm but uh, no, one of my fondest memories uh, hunting with my dad growing up before I could hunt myself was uh, an elk tag, and we ended up actually not killing an elk. But I just remember it was up on the mountains, uh, the foothills of the Bighorns, and uh, we rode horses and four wheelers all day, and just just being outside. And I was actually pretty good at calling elk just with my mouth at that age. I can't do it anymore, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> but. It, I was actually pretty good at it at a young age and that was my first kind of elk hunting experience and got to hear elk bugle back at me and it's like it just jacked me up and like I said we didn't (laughs) we didn't kill an elk I remember I uh I went to Rocky Mountain and I bought uh elk scent (laughs) as you can imagine what it was Mm. (laughs) and my dad got stuck packing it around and I don't remember if it broke or the lid come undone or whatever (laughs) (laughs) but uh uh, and we were sleeping in a camper up there on the mountain and it that's what the camper smelled like (laughs) and still I don't remember how old I was I was young and uh that I remember elk screaming in our face and I remember (laughs) what the camper smelled like (laughs) (laughs) I bet that was lovely uh so, you know, one of the, one of the things I enjoy about you is, uh, I get to go on Facebook and I see some of the photos that you take. Cause you don't just do the hunting side, right? You go hunting with a camera in a lot of instances too. And you'll take some really fantastic photography, not only of the cows, but of course in the antelope and different things that you run into. So yeah. what started that passion for you of getting into photography? Oh, Like I said, I mean, you're always chasing that new excitement, that new goal, and you almost kind of want to make it harder on yourselves. So, uh, oh, I filmed my very first hunt, I think, when I was 15. I mean, just an old point-and-shoot. I don't even remember what kind of camera it was. I looked at the footage like a couple of years ago, and it was just terrible. (laughs) Blurry (laughs) quality was not there. But, I mean, like I said, I I started filming my own hunts because I just remember – you know, at a young age, you'd experience something and you'd go home and try to tell your dad, like, this happened and this happened. And you just couldn't paint the picture that you wanted to. I mean, you, you could try your best and tell the story you wanted. But I was like, well, next time I'm going to take a picture of it. And I went from taking a picture of it to, you know, let's record it. That, that paints the perfect picture, you know. You can replay it and show it. And so then, you know, I'd do that. And I started having the goal of I won't kill an animal anymore unless it's on film. And I 90% i'll probably 99 percent hunt solo so hunting and top of filming it's a whole new ball game it brings a whole new level of challenge to it but i i really like it and i really enjoy it and you know the photography thing is uh um 2017 i killed a 155 inch whitetail on public land 
and I got that on film. And uh, I took a screenshot from the footage, and I printed that picture of the deer right before I shot him. And I, the sun was setting, and it was just on his antlers, and the, his body was in the shadows, and he was on the river bottom, and it was the lighting was just perfect. And I always like to look back at that and be like, not only is that a cool picture of a big deer on public ground during daylight, but it's also a deer I harvested. And it was a deer that I had actually chased all summer. I had pictures of him, but I never seen him in person. So, I mean, he was like a ghost. Um, <laughs> I would have like 12 pictures of him through the month of August. And then I'd hunt him hard in, in September during the bow season. And he was gone. Wouldn't get a picture of him, never seen him in person. And I'd hunt him and hunt him and hunt him. <laughs> so for the guys that are just wanting to get out into doing that same thing, is there a piece of equipment, a camera, something that is, is there kind of a benchmark or something to start with? Is there, give somebody a starting point as far as where should they be looking? Right. Well, if your goals oh, the, the on the video side of things, I would say small and compact. Um, there's a lot of really affordable options say from Nikon or Canon, whatever it may be. But, uh, yeah, get what you can afford and get it to where you can handle it as far as it's not a burden to carry it. <laughs> um, I'm Right now I have I shoot a – it's actually a camera. It's a Nikon D850, and it has a great big lens on it, so it's a pain in the butt to pack around. But uh, the quality is there, and that's what I'm going for. So I would, I would kind of sit down and – go with, with your what your goals are at but uh no there's a lot of great options from starter video cameras all the way up to point and shoot cameras and uh i, I love it I, if if there's someone looking into getting into it i would highly recommend doing it because it just throws a whole new ball game into it i mean and you start to notice things that maybe you're not noticing when you're hunting like you have a bird that lands on a a twig right in front of you and you point your camera and start videoing it rather than you just sitting there looking for an elk or a deer or whatever it may be, which I mean, I mean, those are the small things in the, the hunting that we need to sit back and just relax and soak up some of those things sometimes. So, I mean, that's kind of why we do it is to break away from the, the home life and the work life and just enjoy the outdoors. So it's just another way to do that. Yeah, you have a film out there on your Shiris moose that you killed. And <clears throat> I enjoyed watching the footage of that because you kind of went from, you know, leaving the driveway, you know, leaving the house and heading up and going. So talk a little bit about that hunt and what that was like shooting that one. Yeah, I uh, I looked out and drew the one random tag for a moose permit in 2019. Um and I, it, I've, I've, I've always had the goal to hunt moose in Wyoming. Moose have just always been that staple animal to like, that's the one creature I want to go after. And to do it in our home state, just a icing on the cake. But uh, yeah, to draw the tag was, for one, <laughs> unbelievable. Did not expect it at all. Um, and then going into it, you know, when you first talked to me about starting a, a, this podcast, you talked about uh, once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. And uh, the biggest advice I would have for that is to, uh, obviously, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, so it's probably something you're not going to be able to either afford to do or maybe time won't allow it to do it more than once. That's why it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, obviously, but uh, you've got to get first-hand experience whether it be through someone or talking to someone whatever it may be so for that moose tag I actually had my uh, uncle drew the tag in 2014 and then my cousin drew that tag in 2015 and I was able to tag along on both so that's why I ended up going with the area I did is because I had the first-hand experience tagging along with someone hunting and um, yeah I'd kind of make like a like I said, a checklist of exactly kind of what you're wanting to go into as far as, you know, some guys want to shoot a 50 inch bull or a 40 inch bull. Some guys want to shoot a moose with their bow. Um, some guys just want to shoot a moose for moose meat because moose is delicious. Moose is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I just be extremely specific with, you know, your, what your wants and your goals are for a once in a lifetime opportunity and then find someone that's either going to do it so you can tag along or has already done it and, pick their brain as much as you can so that's what I did and even at the end I hunted 32 days for my moose <laughs> even at the end of that I looked back and was like I wish I would have known now 
what I knew when I first started, you know, on day one, what I knew on day 30. So the cool part about that is two days after I killed my moose, my buddy, he sent me a text. He's like, I think I have enough points to draw that area. Would you guide me next year or help me out? I was like, you better believe it. <laughs> I will go moose hunting again. <laughs> and sure enough, he drew the tag last year and we went hunting and he ended up killing a Boone and Crockett bull about a thousand yards from where I killed mine. So that oh, was really cool. cool. That makes it even more special. Did you film that one as well? My buddies? Yeah. Uh, I didn't get the kill shot on footage. I wasn't with him that day. But uh, I he actually killed his moose on day seven with his bow. And uh, I got some really cool footage, phone scope footage of his bull on day three. We found that bull. And it's just this, it's the biggest bull I think I've seen in person myself. So I, it was a lot of cool. But yeah, I did film parts of his hunt. And then I, uh, like you said, I filmed my hunt. And that was one of the things that was important to me is I wanted, you know, I didn't have a benchmark as far as I had to be a 40 or 50 inch bull. I just said I wanted it to be something that got me excited you know, a respectable bull that got me excited that I would be happy with harvesting. And then I wanted it on film and I wanted to be able to tell the story and, you know, make the film out of it and and, uh, put the icing on the cake. My dad went hunting with me um, two times for the whole trip on day six uh, during the archery season. And we, that was the first day I found the bull that I ended up shooting on day 32. So on day six, we found that bull and we chased him around, played cat and mouse with a bow all day long. And we had a ton of fun and a lot of memories. And we got a lot of that on footage. He had to go back home. And then on day 32, he came up the night before and uh, we went hunting and I ended up killing that bull with him that morning. And like I said, that was just one of those That's things cool. that I, uh, I wouldn't take back a bigger bull if I was by myself or not on film or, you know, whatever those things. So, you know, those little things that uh, trip your trigger or mean the most to you, those are the things that you need to, I guess, make a priority. And I, I want to, you know, touch on, so kind of the next evolution is you take that trophy to the meat locker, to the taxidermist, right? Every, every evening you serve moose meat to your friends and family. But when the moose meat's gone, all that's left is the footage, exactly. the picture, and then that shoulder mount that's hanging at home, right? And, you know, the other one I want to touch on is, and I beat this a little bit too hard, but hunting is conservation, right? I'm still waiting to get my moose tag to go hunting <laughs> moose in Wyoming. I'm I'm salivating <laughs> sitting here going, I want a moose tag. I want to go moose hunting. But I'm going to be reserved enough until I get that tag. And I'm going to pay into conservation for the next umpteen years until yep. I... Um, through the lottery awarded the tag and that system that we've set up since you know the banning of meat market hunting and if you need a history lesson go look at the north american whitetail north american antelope the bison right Mm -hmm. go look at those species and see how hunting is conservation right and it's not you, you already touched about it it's not just the kill yeah it's awesome when you get a kill i mean i can remember my wife getting her moose and our kid was standing in the backpack watching right (laughs) we're right over her shoulder it was the third of four weekends of hunting and she only had weekends to hunt right so we had fridays and saturdays for the month to hunt and we were down to it was (laughs) second to last weekend yep it was second last weekend saturday evening and she's like i don't know if i want to come hunt all two days next weekend and i'm like well We're going to hunt till dark tonight. And we'd had a few opportunities, nothing great. And she didn't kill the world's biggest moose, but we ate moose for two years. Her moose is on the wall. And, you know, we've got, it ain't great video. It's cell phone video, but (laughs) we've got it. Still got it of a kid in a backpack out hunting. Right. Right. So that leads me into my question of what got you into guiding, you know, becoming an outfitter guide. What does somebody need to do if they want to do it? Well, I'm not a a professional outfitter or guide by any means. I did explore that uh, option right out of high school. That's what I thought I was going to pursue for a career. Um, Yeah, I mean, as far as wanting to become a guide, you got to be underneath of a a licensed outfitter. And outfitters are licensed for species and areas, and they only allow so many outfitters per certain species in certain areas type of a deal. But anyways, I would look for 
the type of areas you might want to live in or work in, whatever it may be, and the species you're hunting, finding an outfitter in that realm. And then, I mean, after that, it's pretty much a job interview and uh, having good people skills, uh, physical condition, um, being able to accommodate different types of people, taking them out and uh, maybe having some cooking skills and uh, first aid skills and, uh, you know, survival skills is very important too for most outfitters. So things like that. And other than that, you just got to have the, the love and the passion for hunting and the willing to work. Yes. The work the ethic is huge. Work. <laughs> yeah. It's a whole new ball game when you got to put in twice the work and then you're not the one pulling the trigger. And then you got to, after the, you know, shots taken, you take care of all the, the dirty work too. So Mm-hmm. You got to enjoy that type of thing. You've got to enjoy getting your hands dirty. And, but I mean, yeah, that's why uh, I got into it just because I love so, hunting so much. And, you know, as a Wyoming resident, you can only hold so many tags yourself per year, even if you get, like I do, two doe antelope tags and two doe deer tags. And whether I fill them or not, you know, I always try to get as many tags as I can every year. But uh, that was that was pretty much the whole goal behind it was just to, extend the season and get more opportunities is both filming and taking you know pictures of critters and getting more hunting experience well i got to share some of the critters that i've harvested with you here yep. earlier and the one that comes to mind and i've talked to patrick about it before it's my favorite one is a doe antelope i shot with my boy right and it's the picture he's got his little arm around my shoulder and it's you you can't describe that i can't describe it on film i can't you know the, that connection I have to the land, to my son, to that time and place, you, you can't, you just can't buy that. No, you cannot. Yeah, and <clears throat> talk a little bit about the preparation as a guide. When you know that you've got a hunt and you've got a client that you're taking, there's a ton of preparation that goes into that. It's just like if you're, if you're doing anything that, you know, like especially with the kind of hunts that you're doing, sometimes you're taking people out who have adaptive f- shooters. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, there's, there's people that can't climb that ridge or they can't do this or they can't do yeah. that. So how do you prepare for that? Yeah. Knowing your limitations is probably the most important thing going into it. So whether you're on the hunter side of the thing or the guide side of the thing, I would say the best thing you can do is talk to each other beforehand as many times as you can. And, you know, if you're the hunter say, what do you expect from me? And if you're the guide, I want to know your limitations. And 90% of the time you hear their limitations, divide it in half, (laughs) especially when they're not from Wyoming, like, oh, I'm in good shape. I can handle mountains. And then you take them to 10,000 feet and you go uphill for two steps. Like, ooh, I can't breathe. So, I mean, as as the guide standpoint, you've you want to know their limitations, but you also kind of want to undershoot those things because you want to be prepared for, you know, what they might not be prepared for. But yeah, I am, I do get a lot of situations where, uh, the kid or the wounded veterans, not in a situation where we can go out and hike, we might be hunting strictly from the truck, or we might be limited to so far from a vehicle type of a deal. And, or the limitation might be, they can only shoot a hundred yards because they're 14 and maybe this is their first animal they've ever hunted and they're not comfortable, whatever that may be. I love to go to the shooting range the first thing, if time allows, even if time doesn't allow. The night we get to camp, we at least shoot a rock. We do something. We shoot the gun, whatever it may be. Um, uh, Just kind of get the feelings of them. And uh, uh, the best part that makes the trip enjoyable for me is to get to know those people. Um, uh, We love to go to dinner the first night. We're not hunting and just try to tell as many stories and get to know these people as best we can. And, you know, that just further, I mean, it opens people up and it lets you, them and you enjoy the trip a lot, that much more. So I think building that camaraderie and that friendship, you know, whether you harvest or not, those friendships can last a lifetime, right? If you go out the first night and shoot the world record elk and the guy goes home, you have no emotional connection, right? This guy's come with you two or three years back to back to back and then finally shoots a the goal animal, whatever it is. Now you've, you know, you, you get Christmas cards, you, you see their family and their friends and their kids grow up. And that's that's 
the cool part about being in this community. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I love doing the, the kids with life threatening illnesses hunts. Cause I mean, the parents and, or any kind of family that come with them, they're so appreciative of, you know, what we're doing, even though we don't feel like it's that much, you know, we're just hunting cause we love hunting and we're just tagging you along. But I mean, there's, there's just some incredible people out there and they feel so appreciative that, you know, just a random guy would take time to take their kid out. And I get Christmas cards and so many things every year from all the different families that we take out and get phone calls every once in a while from families like, what's up? What are you guys doing in Wyoming? Is the wind blowing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <the> yes, it <laughs> is. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, but I mean, that's what I love the most about it is, uh, you know, it's not all about the success. It's just about, you know, building those relationships with different people and uh, being able to experience it with those, with, with new people. Yeah. I think relationships is the biggest thing. I mean, that's, it's one of the biggest reasons we hunt, we fish, we go in the outdoors is you want to have good relationships with people and you want to enjoy that time together, yep. <clears throat> create those memories and, and have that. So, you know, when you, when you're taking clients out, Talk about what what for you is, besides the hunting aspect, I mean, is some of your favorite times just the meals around the fire or at the lodge or wherever you guys are at? I mean, is that a, a huge part of it too? Oh, yeah, especially with, uh, you know, the kids or the, the veterans is hearing their stories of, you know, sometimes they're open about it, about their situation in life on day one, and sometimes it takes till day four, till you even talk about they might have a situation they're living with. So either way, though, I mean, just to, to hear their stories and where they come from and what made them who they are now is just, those are the things that I remember the most and enjoy the most. And it usually is at evening time around dinner or back at the hotel or at the camper or wherever it may be. I mean, just uh, I, I've heard some incredible uh, stories from veterans from war after war and their war buddies. And, you know, those are things that I cherish and, and the kids are just awesome too. I mean, being anywhere from 12 to 16, 18 years old and experiencing what they've went through in life and trying to put yourself in their shoes, is just something you can't imagine. So when they're so inspirational about it or a positive mindset, it, it really makes you feel humbled and, you know, appreciative for what you got. So it, it, yeah, it's really special. Yeah, that's awesome. So, uh, you know, as far as guiding, one of the things we like to do on this show is talk about tips and tricks. So if you were to give advice to somebody who's going to hire a guide and go with an outfitter, what are some things you tell them they should do and things they shouldn't do? <laughs> well, kind of like what I already touched based on of if you call up your outfitter and say, what do you expect from me? I mean, there's so many different types of, of guiding. It could be a drop camp or it could be fully guided or you know, whatever it may be. Do you expect me to go grocery shopping? <laughs> Am I packing my own lunch? Are you providing all the meals? You know, are we staying in a hotel? Or are we staying yeah, in a wall tent? That, yes. You pack way different for either one of those. <laughs> oh hunts. yes. Or are we in backpack tents? Yep. And I, I'm, I have a buddy that uh, went on a, 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 a guiding trip back in Asia and he, the language barrier was a little different. And you know, they thought they were staying in a lodge and they ended up sleeping in a cave for two days <laughs> outside. They had it, no idea. It's and a it, lodge, and just was, not ideal. <laughs> and it was freezing. I mean, it was like 30 degrees or colder and they were in bedrolls and all their clothes on, their shoes were on. It's like, those are the types of things you want to avoid. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and just like, uh, like I said, talking with someone that's had firsthand experience, that's super important. The power of social media is awesome. Find somebody that's went with that outfitter or with that guide before and get, say, uh, you know, if you were to do it again, what would you like to know <laughs> beforehand going in or what did, what caught you off guard or what weren't you expecting when you went in? Cause even if you think you've asked the outfitter every question you can think of, they're going to throw a loop in your game that uh, it's completely something random or oddball that you wouldn't have thought of. And, and it's those little things that can definitely make a trip worthwhile or not worthwhile. So, Well, disappointment comes when reality doesn't meet expectation. Right? Yep. And so the closer you can get to knowing the reality of what you're going to be into, 
you know, the, the less disappointment you're going to have. For sure. Yeah, like I said, when I were talking about goals and writing things down of, you know, if you want to shoot a 40-inch moose or a 50-inch moose, and you, I think it's important to have those goals and to write them down, but I also think it's super important to think about if tough comes to tough and, you know, you're on day five of day five and you haven't seen that 50-inch bull yet, are what are you going to do? Are you going to settle for a 40 inch moose and I'm going to be happy or would you rather eat the tag? And those are the type of things you have to have a, a, a decision with yourself and talk to yourself is what will make you happy. And that's one thing I've, I've heard some outfitters say, Oh, guaranteed hundred percent success, right? If, if you're out there and you have an outfitter selling you on a hundred percent success hunt, it, no hunt is 100% nope. success. Even a slam dunk hunt, which should be, you know, maybe a doe antelope hunt in Wyoming, should be a slam dunk. It's never 100%. Never. And so, you know, definitely, like you said, calling past references, checking out their social media. And, you know, for any of the outfitters listening out there, on the client side, I'd rather you say, well, we might see a few elk and I show up and see hundreds. And then you say, oh, we'll see hundreds of elk. And then I show up and the wolves have moved through and there's no elk, right? Overselling what you have oh, yeah. just to get clients is not going to, in the long run, it's not going to be beneficial to you. But there are some organizations that are vetting some of these outfitters and, you know, some of them that have been in, in business for years and years and years, there, there's a reason they have repeat clients. Oh, yeah. So, Is there any piece yeah. of gear specifically that you would... For clients mostly just a, a gear list something really down and dirty s- stuff you think they should have with them man you got to be comfortable so you got to have the right clothes um obviously if you're coming to wyoming you got to be prepared for 20 below to 80 <laughs> degrees and and win for both win in the same <laughs> day yeah i was gonna say <laughs> when to stop that you know negative 10 from piercing through your body yes um i mean good shoes and the correct clothing is so important because if you're not comfortable, you're not going to have fun. You're going to be thinking about, oh, my hands are cold. My face is cold. My toes are cold. Not, wow, look at the sun shining on that look, mountain over there. Look and, at the sun reflect off that bull elk's antlers. Yep. You're not soaking up the little things that you should be and enjoying it. So, um, I mean, other than that, it goes back to, I obviously would never go on a hunt without knives and game bags and, all that type of stuff. So some outfitters might take care of all that stuff, but you need to make sure you organize that beforehand. But yeah, I mean, make sure you're comfortable and prepared. And then talk about the gun too, because David's talked about it before. I mean, I'm, I'm not a guide. I'm not an outfitter, never worked in that world, but I have been around hunters who are not prepared with their actual firearm and they're not prepared same thing happens in bow hunting david's told some stories about that but talk about you know when you're taking a a client you talked about sighting in the rifle at least the night before but talk about how important it is to have that done so that you know things go the way you want as well yeah i mean the biggest thing i'm always concerned about going out with new people is the unethical side of things of injuring an animal that's the one thing i hate to see obviously if you hunt long enough you're going to do it yourself whether it be a bow or a rifle, but it's those things that we want to limit as much as we can. Obviously, that's the thing we don't want to happen, um, but we also got to be aware of those things do happen. But if we can get rid of every variable we can as far as making sure they're steady, making sure their gun's on, obviously, beforehand, and then making sure they're 100% comfortable, knowing their limitations as far as distance, angle, the shot, wind, whatever it may be, but, uh, yeah, like I said, a lot of these hunts, they uh, travel from long distances, whether it be a, a car or a plane. So if their gun got off in that traveling, even your bow, make sure it's on by the time we get there before we ever go hunting. We're not even going to go drive around scouting and looking at things until we get that <laughs> bulleted proof, you know, that's done. Sure. And, uh, and a lot of circumstances, too, they use our guns. I'll bring my gun and or I'll have a buddy that brings his gun. And so when they're traveling, they don't have to worry about it or go through the checklist of, you know, having the locks and the ammo separate and all the rules and regulations of flying with, you know, weapons. So 
a lot of times we'll just say, you just pack all your clothes. We'll take care of the knives, the game bags, the gun, everything you can imagine. You just come clothed. We'll even <laughs> bring extra binos. I mean, pretty much supply them with everything they need besides their clothes. So, and, um, but at the same point, I know my gun's on. I know how to shoot my gun. I trust my gun. I want to make sure you can do it too. So you, st- I don't care how good of my how good my gun is on, you still make sure they're comfortable with it. So you still go through the loops of shooting that gun. That makes a lot of sense. And so, you know, when you, when you're out with the client and things don't go the way that, you know, things are planned and, you know, that situation comes up, what do you do to mitigate that? I mean, how do you, how do you approach it? Like if someone maybe misses a shot or, you know, another hunter comes across the ridge and the animals take off or they harvest that animal. So so what do you do then? Oh man, being a guide, whether it be for a kid or an 80 year old wounded veteran, you're almost a glorified babysitter. (laughs) So when those bad things happen, as far as whether they miss or the elk gets your wind and goes over a mountain and he's in a canyon and he's gone, being able to keep spirits high and keep people on the positive side of things is definitely important because there's always tomorrow. And even if there's not tomorrow, I've ran into that just this last year. It's my first time we were ever unsuccessful on a hunt with a wounded veteran. And it was a three day uh, deer hunt here in central Wyoming. And uh, we ended up eating the tag. And um, on the very last day, I mean, we we went through the, we looked at the first two days and said, you know, this day it was good in the morning here. This day it was better in the evening here. And we were flip-flopped. So on day three, we're going to do what we think's the hundred percent, you know, true and true best way to get it done. And it still doesn't happen. Those are the things in life that just, you got to roll with the flow. I mean, there's nothing you can do. You can't go back and change it. So you can't, you can't eat yourself up on it and you can't live in the past. So, I mean, you try to comfort them and make them feel as good as you can. But uh, at at your point, if you do it long enough, those things are going to happen. And so to that, if if you're on a guided hunt, right, and there's an animal that you would be happy with taking the last day, standing there the first day. Shoot it. Shoot it. (laughs) Right. That is a rule I live by is if you would be happy with that animal, even if it's not the last minute or the last hour, if it's the second to the last day. Shoot it. <laughs> Tag soup does not taste very good. No, if anybody's ever tried to make it, it's it's really simple. A pot of water, a tag, boil it, put it in, and try and eat it. You can yeah. add salt and pepper, but it don't go down. <laughs> well, speaking of seasonings, we got to talk about another sponsor. It's High Mountain Seasonings. Um, so when you do yeah, become well, successful and get that critter down. When you shoot that deer and you fill that tag and you don't have to make tag soup, I highly recommend High Mountain Seasonings, and Blake knows all about it. Oh, yeah. Dave and I know all about it. In fact, just finished up a homemade ham with High Mountain Seasonings, cured up the ham, came out really, really good. Um, Yeah, the guys down there, they're great. They have a great website from from field to table, anywhere in between. If you just want to make hamburgers, you just want to season fish, they've got you covered. If you want to go all the way into making your own sausage, stuffing your own, you know, making your own hams, High Mountain Seasonings has you covered. And if you do go and have success on that deer or that elk, try their jerky kits. Their jerky kits are really foolproof. If you follow the directions, you're going to have a product that you really enjoy. So so I really like the uh, whole muscle tissue jerky, right? I like it chewy and stringy. Um, but we also do the grind meat jerky, mm-hmm. which if nobody out there's ever, the instructions are really easy. Basically, just take the seasoning, mix it with ground hamburger, put it in a jerky shooter gun, shoot it onto wax paper, put it in the oven, or you can put it in the smoker or the dehydrator, any one of the three. And my kids and my wife just, man, they go through that stuff like it's free and like I don't have any labor (laughs) making it. I'll make a gallon bag and it's gone the same day. And all three of us do this stuff every year. So don't be intimidated. I mean, if I can do it, you can do it. I mean, it's not hard. Right, David? It's not hard. Blake, you do it every year. It's the animal's different. already dead. You're not going to kill it anymore. <laughs> you can't mess up too much more. The only thing I'll say is just don't overcook it. Don't overcook venison, but, please. Yeah. But no, that's that's awesome. I want to transition into something 
a little bit more technical. And I like to ask this, I did this with Troy Linder the other day, talking about the approach when you're, you know, fishing and hunting, you have the same kind of things you have to think about in some ways, like a fish isn't going to smell your wind as you come by, but right. they we have the see. client. We're there. You yeah. fired the rifle. You've had dinner. You've got your clothes. You finally found this animal. Now the fun begins. Now, the how fun, do you, so how do you go about yeah. that? And what's the approach like? Um, man. So it obviously it's a, a very wide topic. You can break it down per species per time of year. I mean, you can get so specific with it, but, uh, you know, talking about, uh, stalking on something or getting close to it. Um, I love playing the wind obviously, but knowing your species, if I'm hunting antelope, I could care less about the wind. Some people may disagree with that. <laughs> I play the sun and I play the terrain. I, if they're in a stockable position, those are the ones I'm going for. I don't care if my wind's blowing straight towards them. 90% of the time an antelope is, if it's laying there and has no idea you're there, you could smell like greasy burgers that you ate at lunch and <laughs> they're going to lay there. <laughs> now they can also see you at 700 yards. Yeah, exactly. That's why I say play the sun and play the terrain. Because if they don't see you, 99% of the time you're going to fool their nose and you're going to fool their ears. And even if they get up and they they sense something's wrong. If you completely freeze and you're in a spot where you're not exposed and the sun's to your back and they're looking right into the sun, they'll look at you maybe two, three minutes, turn around and go back to what they were doing. That's a fighter pilot technique, right? Come out of the sun and your opponent can't see you. It works very well with, yes. with game. Now fishing, I think that'd be a little different. You, you don't, you don't want your shadow cast anywhere because <laughs> if you're approaching a trout stream and your shadow goes over the water, even your rod tip can get you in trouble. So I know we've got careful. away several times moving in a position, you know, skylined over a ridge. Oh, yeah. That you you wouldn't get away with. And we've got away with it either early morning or late evening because that critter is having to look straight at the sun and we're coming straight out of the sun at them. If you would have tried that, at you know, same maneuver at noon. Never would have got away right. with it. Right. And I know a lot of people uh, to eliminate their noise. They like taking their shoes off, which <laughs> I'm evidently not that strong. Cause I'm never been a person to, to do that. I just like to take my time and use the shoes that I think are equipped for that. Because too many times I found myself when I've tried this before is my shoes are 100 yards behind me and the game plan completely changes and I ended up needing to move fast or do something. And then you're running through wyoming <laughs> cactus <laughs> so i have some over boots that go over my shoes right yes or you could take a piece of carpet and some paracord and make some of these if you wanted yes. to those can help that you know and, and we got a caveat are we talking about we're using a traditional bow and trying to sneak in on a mule deer at seven yards right. or are we you know sneaking on an antelope for a rifle shot at well, 195 yards. And Rick right. Parrish talked about that, you know, the sneaky feet and, you know, there's, there's products out there for that. So if you're doing that, I mean, that's an option, but double look at socks. other options rather than <laughs> just taking your shoes off and throwing them behind a tree. Cactus well, a, at least a second pair of wool socks. If you're <laughs> going to do that, you're going to have cactus in them when you're done. And a, a wonderful app I like to use is on X. And if I did that, track your shoes <laughs> put a waypoint on where they're at because you'll spend 30 minutes looking for them it was by that sagebrush but man they all look the same though i cringe on tv every time i see you know an elk hunter take their quiver off their bow and lean it against the tree next to them when they're in a calling situation with a collar behind them that bull may come in and hang up or or wind you and whirl and you may need to move 12 yards and get a shot the plan changes yep. and maybe that first shot you hit a limb or you know, your knock breaks or whatever. Maybe that first shot doesn't hit home, but that bull still's hanging around trying to figure out what's going on. And right. Now your quiver's you 12 yards <laughs> behind you. You don't have another arrow. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know about you, but I love practicing how I play. So I always shoot my bow with my quiver on. So I would never take my quiver off because then my bow's going to shoot a little different. I just got done with a total archery challenge and I look a little bit weird because I'm running around with a, a full backpack on, right? But when I'm hunting here in Wyoming... Exactly. I got to have my personal locator beacon. I got to have my first aid kit. I've got to have my winter weather clothing because we can go from 80 <laughs> degrees in sunshine to 20 <laughs> degrees in snowing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and I got to have my bear defense stuff. And that's all on my backpack, right? And so I very rarely 
<laughs> drop that backpack. I mean, if I if I'm going in on like maybe a bedded bull, mm-hmm. right? And it's midday, and I've got him on his bed, and it's a hundred yards away. I might drop my pack. Now I, I haven't been as wise as you as a. Uh, Marking my backpack on Onyx, <laughs> and a couple times that hundred yard turns into two, three hundred yards, and the sun's starting to get a little lower, and I've had a sinking feeling in my stomach of can't find it. Where is my camo backpack? Yep, <laughs> especially when it gets dark. Yeah. So, how do you approach elk differently than antelope? Oh man, because <laughs> everybody wants to know about elk. Man, the the biggest thing is just understanding what an elk needs in his day-to-day life. Food, water, and they love the dark timber, their shelter, their bedding areas. So understanding what they're going to do within a day and then pressure is all another ball game too. If you're hunting a general area where they're having a ton of pressure, where is their sanctuary areas where they're going to go when they get that pressure? What is the temperature that day? Because a bull elk has his fur coat on all day right he doesn't get to take that off and that goes back to moose hunting too i mean when i was hunting moose the first of september it was 85 degrees they have a jet black cape on you would hunt for literally 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes at night that first week of bow season because it was so hot they would be out all night long and right as this you know not even the sun was not even rising yet it was just light outside and they were out moving around once that sun came up they're bedded down and they're gone and you would think a moose could would be obviously to see <laughs> as big and black as they are, they can still hide <laughs> in the smallest willow patch they can. But, but yeah, it's exactly the same thing with with elk. Um, you know, they're living out in these conditions year round. We can take a jacket off; they can't. But we, November rifle season, they'll be on a southern exposed ridge, standing right, out there midday, trying to so warm, warm up. up. Fi- <laughs> figure your species, figure out where they're at, what the terrain is, what the temperature is, what they need. Like you said, you know. And wind is pretty important with elk. I know that from my experience. They, yes, they have a good I, nose. I wouldn't play <laughs> play the antelope game and completely <laughs> avoid the wind. But uh, at, and and that's a big thing too. Is you know hunting whitetail in your backyard, you can control your scent a whole lot more. Now, when you're on a seven to ten day elk hunt, where you're either sleeping in a tent or in a camp or whatever it may be, cooking on a fire every day not taking a shower, you're not going to ever eliminate your scent. So you've got to play a bigger part of, you know, having that in the back of your mind. I'm not going to cover my scent. I have a scent and they're going to pick up on it for sure. So, Well, the other thing I want to caveat is everybody talks about how good a whitetail's nose is. An elk's nose is like four times bigger. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, (laughs) you think they have less olfactory glands and less capability and can filter less air through that nose? They live and they live and die on scent. Yeah. And I mean, an elk doesn't live in the same, you know, looking at it as, say, back east or even here in Wyoming. I mean, for the most part, whitetail live in a an area that's pretty secure it's pretty small they have a bedding area they have a food source and a trail that they go to that and if something's wrong off they know it and they're gone yep i mean you're to kill a white tail you either have to go to their food source or their bed their backyard you know their bedroom and you're not going to fool a white tail very many times in their bedroom they're just too smart now an elk at the same point they don't just live in one little small pot so they use a different bedroom sometimes every day exactly yeah. So, I mean, they're, for instance, their instincts are sometimes even cranked up even higher. I mean, when you're talking about a rutting bull, he's obviously got something else on his mind. But if you're in the early, earlier season or the later season after he's already, you know, covered his cows and he's just on basically food, he's recovering at that point to go into the winter. Um, you know, his senses are still a lot higher than they were when he was rutting. I'm always amazed at, you know, as technology and equipment improve and, you know, hunters are becoming more and more successful and we have more and more just information out as far as, you know, the World Wide Web, just hunters are getting better and being more successful. You know, when a guy harvests a a big bull elk, a a 7 to 10 year old elk, I mean, that elk survived a lot of seasons and got past a lot of hunters. He's seen people, yeah. So just transitioning a little bit, um... You know, the different organizations that you work with, can you talk about them a little bit and just, you know, I guess 
not only who you work with, but if there are listeners out there that are inspired by this, they're like, you know, I want to go help support that, you know, where they would go to do that. Okay, so here locally, our our big uh, foundations are the Mealy Fanatic Foundation and Hunting with Heroes Wyoming. Um, I'm on the local chapter for the Mealy Fanatic Foundation. And going back to the conservation side of things, I mean, everything we do as far as research, fundraising, um, you know, all the knowledge we go into, and it's not just mule deer, it's all wildlife. It's going 100% back into conservation. And then we turn around and we do these things like taking kids out on on hunts with life-threatening illnesses to give back to the hunting community. But uh, as far as like non-hunting uh, organizations goes that might be listening, you know, when you see a, a wildlife sign, a crossing sign on the side of the road or an underpass or an overpass like over in Pinedale, conservation dollars are what paid for that. Hunters are what paid for that. And we don't just do that for wildlife aspect. It's also protecting everyone that drives on those roads. So Before those bridges went in, there was hundreds of deer laying along each side of the shoulder yes. of those roads yeah. every year. And now you drive through there, there's almost no deer mm-hmm. getting hit by vehicle mortality, right? Right. And they st- and they started, uh, you know, from research, doing different research for like mule deer, for instance, they found out that antelope don't use underpasses. So that's why they build these great big overpasses because they like to use their eyes, obviously, in the wide open sceneries. And since they did these overpasses and more antelope use those overpasses than anything. And I mean, you don't hit an antelope on the road anymore. With the wildlife fencing, they can't cross anywhere else. They go over the bridge. They can go wherever they need. And the other thing, back to research, is, um, you know, what we're finding out with mule deer is everything revolves around their their fat count every year. And the less stress we can implement on a, an, an animal, the healthier they're going to be, the healthier that fawn's going to be. And that fawn, um, his, his health rating as a fawn is what's going to determine what he's going to be at in his peak you know life everyone likes to hunt big deer but if that buck at five years old has a terrible uh his mom is in terrible condition when he's a fawn he's never going to reach that full potential and And that's what i was going to say is we already know that from the cattle industry right exactly you want want your mama cows to be fat and happy when they're dropping their calves so when you take calves to sale in the spring summer fall you've got Healthy, heavy, you know, good calves. Yep, we pour mineral to them. We feed them extra when it's cold outside. We try to baby them as much as we can. So I really want to stress, you know, as as we're trying to do that right now this time of year, everybody's itching to get out and go shed hunting, right? Yes. I, I love picking up sheds, but we have some season closure dates, right? And I'm starting to hear rumors of guys going in on sleds or pre you know, openers and piling up antlers so they can go pick them up on the or on back the to market them on their GPS. Yep. That completely defeats the purpose of why those dates are set there. Those dates are set there so that we can have these healthy fawns, so that we can reduce the stress on the wildlife. Right? If if everybody waits, kind of like Easter morning, right? When you go to get Easter eggs, if somebody else has already gone out two hours before you and rounded them all up, what you know that that defeats the whole purpose, right? So. I mean, I just, I know that's my soapbox, but we're still waiting in this household to go pick up sheds. It's not time yet. We <laughs> right. had a really nasty storm yesterday. Yeah, right? not that long ago. The, the grass isn't popping. There isn't new feed available and all the winter forage is pretty well gone. This, this little six week transition period we have going on right now, it really is the most crucial time oh, yeah. of year. You know, the spring storms are really the ones that take the tolls on the females and even, I mean, even bucks or bulls, um, you know, like I said, their fat count is so important and we've kind of had a mild winter through the first part of the season. I mean, it's been reasonably warm and we haven't had much for snow at all. And now you just jump into these extremely cold temps and dumps heavy, heavy, wet snow in the spring. I mean, that's what takes tolls on animals. And that's the research that we're compiling right now. And this is also the time, like you said, that guys are wanting to get out the weather's nice today oh, i'm itching i want to go yeah <laughs> just wait two three weeks yeah <laughs> let that grass grow let let the temperatures pop up a little more and then they're again not in super distress and not going into critical danger of using all those fat reserves to run away from you and run away from a little bit of good grass they're on back to where there's no feed at all yep well and to your point i mean the 
Game and Fish just dropped down the amount of tags that they're going to issue for antelope. For right? antelope. Well, well, why is that? Well, we had a very dry year last year. And you said it, we had a mild winter, but now we're getting these storms. Antelope are dying. I mean, it's it's been a really tough year on wildlife in general just because you, you combine a, a drought, you know, and then if these animals are getting pressured at this point because they have nothing left, I mean, they are ri- literally running on fumes. It's like you got to just leave those animals alone. And now that we've got some green grass popping up, I've been watching the antelope, man. They're all over it. They, they're they consuming as fast as they can. I want to give kudos to our state agency. And, you know, I've been around other states and noticed that they just maintain the tags or increase them every year no matter what. And they keep going, well, we hope we'll have a good fawn recruitment and numbers will bounce back, right? And then success decreases, overall herd health and numbers decrease. And here in this state, you know, yeah, your favorite unit might have just got its tags decreased this year. But what that means is in a year or two, they're going to increase the tags again as soon as the population has that uptick swing again. So that I really do want to, you know, I've noticed that since since being here. No, the- I do think Wyoming Game and Fish does an excellent job of actually going out and counting throughout the winter months, whether it be elk herds or mule deer herds. And, and you know, this research we have from collaring mule deer, we know that just because we count them here in this month in December does not mean that is where they live. And that's they not move. where they are when they're during hunting season. I, I don't remember which one we're talking about, but there's one of those does collared that went from, you know, Southern rock Springs area all the way up into basically the other side of Idaho up into the park at right? yep. West Yellowstone area, like 250 miles. She migrates yep. from, from winter to spring summer range. That's, that's a long ways. Yeah. And these are information that we had. I mean, we had no idea that, deer did this that's like over three mountain ranges to get there and back right and it's not over a 12 month period she's going over like three months or two months in the spring and three or two months in the fall back and forth right you know another cool thing about migrating is when a fawn migrates with its mother that first year they can memorize that path perfectly just from doing it one time with their mother and they will remember it as as long as they live now if their mother dies or you know, runs into uh, uh, some kind of barrier like a highway, especially man-made things, gets hung up with a fence, that fawn also memorizes that. Say that doe dies from getting hit on the road halfway through their their migration. Now that fawn's going to stop there every year. It's not going to go past that. I mean, there is some kind of animal instincts where they might obviously get out of the situation they're in, but they won't continue on that migration like they would have if their mother would have survived. That's information we didn't know about. So, I mean, the the easiest we can make it for them, getting rid of the, the highway barriers, the fencing, um, even the private land access and building houses and infrastructure and towns and things like that. I mean, it's, it's so important to know these things because, I mean, you can... Well, you look at northern Utah, right? And in the 70s, northern Utah used to be a big mule deer area. I'm sorry, but the whole west... West face right there, right, is now just all those benches that were great winter mule deer habitat are now houses. And they don't have big mule deer up in the northern part of the stadium. They just don't have the numbers. Right, and why? (laughs) They don't have the winter ground. They don't have the feet. I mean, and and we run into so many problems every year, and and so many different agencies have problems, but they don't know why. They might do some kind of research to figure out, you know, what their issues are. You know, we had a nasty fawn crowd last year was it because of the weather was you know what was it and these anti-agencies hear us talk this way and say well we just want to increase the numbers to to harvest more deer right but you know a lot of this research a lot of this information a lot of this protection it's back to my (laughs) hunting is conservation right i want my kids and my grandkids to go chase big mule deer and and have that same connection to the land that i do well and i think this is the story that hunters need to tell is why do you care so much? Because most people don't see hunters as caring that much. You know, they're like, oh, they just want to kill that animal. It's like, no, they they want to preserve that animal. They want to help that animal have better recruitment year after year after year after year so that there are more animals on the landscape. Just like what you're talking about, Blake. I mean, it's obvious you're passionate about that. You want to see more mule deer. Well, the only way to do that is through our hunting organizations like the only fanatics and other places like that. So, I mean, and you touched on it earlier, 
if you do this long enough, you're going to lose or, or, or wound an animal, right? Yep. And I've been sick about it, up all night. Don't sick, sleep. Don't sleep. Go spend a lot of my time looking, and I'm hoping, I've and I've recovered some a couple times. Not always, but I have gone out there and done it and recovered a couple. There's a bull elk hanging in this building that was, you know, I recruited a couple guys with some really high level skill and we did a mile and a half track job and it was a 20 yard archery shot, Blake. It wasn't like I was pushing the envelope, right? Right. Things happen. You do this long enough, but I don't feel that, and I see it when I'm driving down the road and I see a a fresh doe hit on the the road. I go, man, what a waste, right? That doe could have lived, had a fawn. Somebody could have harvested either the doe or the fawn the next year and, and that doe could have gone on perpetuating the species versus somebody just and i've had a couple in the car there's nothing you can do about it i'm not saying i'm intentionally swerving towards them right it you drive it into the sun at at seven o'clock and one hops on the road there's nothing you can do but you look at the amount of deer that are hit every year in this country and the amount that are harvested through hunting i'm sorry the people on their (laughs) cell phones are more deadly than the hunters yeah that's a fact eight mule deer a day get killed on the highway in wyoming Eight. Every day. Every day. Multiply that by 365. That's a lot of deer. By a couple of years. And it, 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 on the trend is going up, too. It's not going down. So that's obviously a major issue of how do we limit this number? One, from growing, but how do we get it to go downhill rather than uphill? Yeah, and the insurance companies are going to thank you if there's less because, I mean, it, it does affect that, too. I mean, it makes insurance rates go up depending on where you live. If you live in a... A high kill area, you know, a high collision area. Two boys, why? It's going to affect you. Yeah, no kidding. Because that winter range up there, there's a lot of deer. And I mean, there's been days that you drive through there or up by Matitsi and you see literally hundreds and hundreds of mule deer. And yeah, they like to wander out on the highway because they can find more feed there or whatever it might be. So. And we, we've talked about it on the podcast before on. On Burma, there's a buck antelope that love to be photographed right there on the corner. I mean, and it was a, getting to be a pretty decent, decent good buck. He was pushing 80. He was a good one. And he got whacked the other day. But, you know, kind of, I love to just go look at mule deer. I love to take pictures of mule deer, big deer, little deer, film deer. I mean, and I know you like to do that as well. Is there a deer hunt or a filmed hunt that you've done that you just really sticks out in your mind as one people need to go look, go watch that you've put out? Oh man, after still being on the high of what we did last year in, in Dubois with that leukemia survivor, that is by far one of the best mule deer hunts I've ever been on in my life. Um, add on the nasty weather. <laughs> so many times we have to be <laughs> uncomfortable to remember it. <laughs> and I guarantee you those South Carolina boys are never going to forget that. <laughs> Their trip to Wyoming in the wind. 30 mile an hour <laughs> winds and blowing snow and just freezing temperatures but icing you know cherry on the on the cake is you know shooting 185 inch mule there at 10,000 foot <laughs> public ground when i mean you got more hunters all the way around you and you were the one that killed the deer that day yeah that was a really good story and that video that you shot was great it was cool to see the good shot i mean you made a great shot and just the excitement and just his story is so cool. And so if, if anybody's out there listening and they haven't seen that, I mean, you can get it on YouTube. You can look it up. You can go back and listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast, hear the story. I mean, it's it's truly inspiring. It's a good feel, good it's, story. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, and I've taken a lot of kids out. I've taken a lot of veterans out, and we've even killed bigger animals. I mean, we've killed big 340-inch bull elk before. <laughs> I don't care if that deer would have been 160 inches. I mean, it was just, it was something <laughs> special. To have it be 185 inch dark chocolate horn deer, <laughs> speechless. But uh, the whole experience, I mean, we had to grind it out for every single day and we killed that deer on the last day we had to hunt and we never had a, a break in weather that whole trip. And those are things that happen, especially here in Wyoming. You might be prepared for bad weather, but when you never get a break, I mean, it wears on you. And, but I mean, that was one, one tough kid and he powered through the whole week. And, and there's something about, 
you know, like you said, even if it had been a 165-inch deer, and I, I'm not huge into inches, you mm-hmm. know, I, I mean, I just like deer, and I like unique deer, but when you get into that upper age class, the upper S launch, bucks that have survived multiple, multiple years of, you know, because they get into that 140 category, four point, guys with rifles start looking pretty close mm-hmm. at them, right? And they have to get smart, and, and it's just neat to, I, I'm glad you guys killed it, because I... I mean, if you showed me 140 inch deer, yeah, cool, cool story, bro, right? Tell me that story, and you show me that deer, and, and why. It's not the inches. It's not the total inches. It's that he harvested a mature buck that was on the downhill, right, or going to be on the downhill very quick. And, you know, some of these deer, you know, he may have made it one or two more years, but he's not making it five more years. No. Nope. No. And Mother Nature's not very kind when Mother Nature finally decides to harvest that deer, right? It's six, seven months of starvation, especially the end of the spring. They're pretty much suffering. Yep. You know, there's, there's that photo we talked about earlier that was taken at the park of that ginormous bull elk. The coyote Same sat thing. there and ate, right? He didn't have the energy to get up and, you know, if it had been a wolf, I could kind of understand. But a bull elk and a coyote, that's a right. That's really an uneven match. The bull elk's got the upper hand all day long. Yep, age and weather was just beat him to death mother nature i mean but he was done contributing to the genetic pool mm-hmm. he's on the downhill side unfortunately be to wherever his life was he he didn't get harvested by a hunter and you know i say unfortunately because that was a rough end for that bull elk right you don't want to you, you don't wish that upon him because you know you'd rather shoot him yourself but you wish you know someone to shoot him just because of your thinking of him personally it's a lot easier to get taken out of this world fast and easy and ethical rather than drag it out and suffer. I mean, I think of, I've had several pet dogs, right? And when they get down to where they're no longer, their life is no longer viable, yeah, exactly. you're just going to let them suffer out in the back kennel? That's a good metaphor. Yeah, nobody likes to see that, that's for sure. So what is your favorite critter to hunt this is one of my favorite questions to ask if you had to if you only got one weapon one species the rest of your life that you had to chase what would it be and what would it be with oh man you're probably gonna be upset again because i'm gonna say moose (laughs) (laughs) i've done it five times and i can't get enough of it saving the pennies and i'm going to alaska one day i hope by the time i draw another moose tag in wyoming i probably will be dead before this <laughs> <laughs> well having lived in in alaska make sure you get your hip boots be ready for rain and your shyrus moose mm, it's kind of like a, a a a cow compared to a bull right, right. You look at an 800 pound cow standing in the feedlot. That's a Shiras moose. Go look at the 2,000 pound bull running around. You know, that is the, those Alaskan moose. Right. I could still kind of spin my Shiras moose around and kind of prop him up for pictures. Not gonna happen. <laughs> the moose I want to shoot in Alaska, where he lays, is where he lays, and that's where the picture's gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you're, you know. So my wife got hers, and it was a younger bull, smaller bull, and I worked him halfway up before she even got back with the with the vehicle and whatnot. It was just before dark. I sent her to go move the vehicle close to where we were, as close as we could. And I had two quarters off that thing and a back strap before she got back. I was pretty proud. In Alaska, you can't lift a quarter by yourself, just so you know. Yeah. Well, I'll look forward to it. <laughs> you'll, 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 it's, it's worthy, man. Just keep saving your pennies. So speaking of that, it's, uh, you know, time to ask you about your favorite recipe. You know, if you were to eat any wild game, what would be your favorite thing that, you know, you like to have? Well, I'm going to sound bad saying moose is probably my favorite <laughs> meat too. <laughs> but man, what I do every year, because uh, you only sh- usually shoot one moose in, in a family once, right. you know, in a decade probably, if you're lucky. Um, so I usually have a lot of antelope and a lot of deer every year, just a supply of it. And I love making jerky and I love making summer sausage. Those are things that, I mean, just get the ground meat ate up faster than anything else. Um, I do have a summer sausage recipe. All right, because I think we got your jerky one the last time. Yes. So this will be good. All right. 
The summer sausage, I actually just got some from a buddy of mine down in Cheyenne. He got his bison, and I got a little bit of summer sausage off of that, and that was really good. Yeah, I have eaten bison before, too, and it's awesome. Mm-hmm. So this one, um, the recipe calls to add pork if you want to. I've done it both with and without, and I think it's just as good. But uh, the recipe calls for three pounds of venison, two pounds of pork, it's five tablespoons of uh, tender quick curing salt, one tablespoon black pepper, one teaspoon of mustard seed, one teaspoon of or one tablespoon of sugar, one tablespoon of garlic powder, four fresh jalapeno peppers, half pound of high temperature cheddar cheese. I pick up my casings at uh, High Mountain. I have uh, a, a jerky shooter and a sausage shooter that I use and fill them up, and then I usually just throw them in the smoker and get the in internal temperature where it needs to be and any kind of special wood in your smoker anything you like particularly i like hickory hickory's got a punch to it i love it, it. does my two favorite woods if you're going to smoke anything hickory and apple i was I mean, just about to say apple uh, apple has a different so good different flavor i like doing pies or um i've never tried bread before but i've tried i've heard that bread doing bread is really good in a smoker I'm going to have to try that now. (laughs) You've inspired me. (laughs) So what would you say, you know, somebody else out there that wants to get into mentoring and hunting and conservation? Is there there an organization? Is there a way to to start? And where should they start? Oh, yeah. I mean, everything, everything in life pretty much is who you know, not what you know. Obviously, there's whether you have a dream or whatever it may be, there's someone that's already done it or is also pursuing it at the same time. So definitely look around. Like I said before, the power of social media, as much as some people don't like it, what we have information wise at our fingertips to find somebody or a business or an organization is so important. But yeah, the Muley Fanatic Foundation, Hunting with Heroes Wyoming, uh, going to different banquets like the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation or things like that, supporting conservation efforts and money like that. And uh, if you can't find someone that loves hunting that would be willing to to spread their knowledge, you're probably not looking in the right places because there's plenty of those people out there. You just got to find someone that loves hunting, really, and you'll find someone that is willing to teach you or willing to, you know, spread knowledge. So I, I know at my company, Bow Spider, you know, we've been – a big advocate of Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and, and supporting them through conservation and, and some of our ad dollars go there. But what I really like about their organization is when they protect an acre of ground for an elk, right? What else benefits? Everything. Because if, if the he- ecosystem and habitat is intact for that large ungulate, you know, to, to be healthy enough to have an elk survive there, squirrels, rabbits, you know, fish, hawks, birds, fish, snakes, yep. it all, it's all protected. It's no longer a strip mall. So, you know, why do I get so passionate about protecting elk? Well, I, yeah, I like to see a red tail hawk. Sure. It's cool to see a gardener snake, but you know, let, let's work on the, the, the bull elk and, and everything <laughs> else will fall in line behind that. Right. Yeah. I mean, that goes back to the point of, you know, conservation doesn't just benefit hunters and it doesn't just benefit wildlife like i said when you're protecting your highways and making them safer you're protecting your daughter that might be going to school you're protecting your grandma that's traveling to church whatever it may be i mean the most simple one i can come up with is as a waterfowl guy right you buy a waterfowl stamp every year how many millions of acres of wetland have been conserved rebuilt reestablished because of those dollars right and then you get guys that like to enjoy birding and i'm not going to pick shoot pick on guys that like to you know enjoy birding but i would ask them have you gone out and bought your conservation stamp while you're walking around those wetlands taking pictures of those waterfowl exactly right so yeah the consumptive guys the waterfowlers are harvesting those birds but waterfowlers are a diehard breed right those are the ones paying for it too those are the guys paying for those birds so don't throw stones and, and pick at those guys. You know, if you're a birder and you've bought your conservation stamp, we can sit down and have a, an open discussion. But until then. Right. You know, so many anti hunters love to say, you know, how do you love an animal if you can kill it? Well, at the same point, if you love that animal so much, what have you put into it? And 90% of you look at PETA, all their money goes towards basically faith, 
fake advertising. I mean, they're just trying to get the, the all, all you need to do is if you're questioning an organization and its merits, <laughs> just go look at its overhead, its structure and where it's money spent, see you know? where it's spending its money. Hey, exactly. Whether it's muley fanatics, whether it's hunting with heroes, whether it's Rocky mountain elk foundation, whether it's ducks unlimited pheasants forever, any of those, you look at them, three quarters of their budget goes to, some sort of mission, some sort of good in the field work. Right. They're not spending money to try to kill more animals. They're spending money to try to get more animals. Yeah. And you look at PETA, they have a 90% overhead, right? And 10% of it goes to their kill shelter. So don't, don't, don't tell me you're a member of PETA and you love animals. You might love animals, right. but PETA is not doing anything for those animals. Right. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about an organization that I like, which is Bow Spider. And I'm not just sucking up to David here, but <laughs> now Bow Spider does sponsor this podcast. And you talk about, you know, companies that invest in their community and do things. Well, Bow Spider is doing that. We, you know, we talk about how there's so much manufacturing of products done where? Well, in China or somewhere other than the U.S. And it's really cool because, like, the Bow Spider. <laughs> That stuff is manufactured here in the United States, and I'm really proud of that, and I know David is as well, and that's a big part of it. And um, if you haven't been out to check out the bow spider, definitely do it. And it, it It's harder to manufacture here. It's more, more expensive. expensive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I could make more money. I could have less heartache by shipping this overseas okay. tomorrow. Absolutely. But you don't do it. I'm not going to do it. And you support people who are living and working in the United States. And in fact, in Riverton where we're at. So go to bowspider.com, support an American company, American made. Um, it's got some really cool stuff on the website. That's new. Talk about that a little bit, David. So, you know, we've got the, uh, new attack packs. Those are for my guys that, uh, want to go solo without a backpack, whether it's spot and stock antelope, whether it's spot and stock mule deer, where you want to drop your pack and undo that final stock. You know, it's also working for guys that maybe they're doing turkey or hog or whitetail and they just want to go to and from the stand without a backpack at all. It's a really cool system. You know, there we just come out with those. I like them. I've been wearing them at the trade shows. Check that out. We have uh, the new Molly Web uh, pucks. So if you have Molly webbing on your backpack and you want to, you know, have a quick interchange from your receivers, it's much faster to just buy those. They, they just got two steel, steel belt clips that'll clip through the molly webbing. And we did uh, get some branded knives from old Josh Smith with Montana Knife Company. I really am a huge fan of that knife. We've talked about it on a previous podcast. I had a horse wreck, you know, and my knife, which I love, is the Outdoor Edge EDC carry for breaking down game. You can change the blades out, super right. sharp, great knife. But I keep losing clip knives out of my pockets all the time when I had that horse wreck and needed to cut some ropes to get horses untied from each other. And I mean, we're talking upside down in a ravine where I didn't think those horses would be out. <laughs> I thought I'd be putting my beloved pets down. Right. And, uh, they're, they're here. They're fine. They're, they're good today, but I needed a knife to get ropes cut to get them untangled and get them standing back up and off each other. I didn't have a knife on me. So that knife that Josh Smith has, has a really cool Kydex sheath check it out i mean i carry it right on my pack strap and when i need a knife it's right there it's also american made ball bearing steel super tough knife full yeah, tank construction i mean <laughs> supporting another american made company right it's, there it's right? the real deal handmade i mean those those are high quality knives so yeah definitely go check those out those are those are huge well blake it's been awesome having you in and getting to hear some of your experiences and share some tips and tricks with everybody one of the things I like to do is, you know, bringing people on is awesome, but then how do they get in touch with you later? Because maybe people will have questions. Maybe they want to go out and buy your stuff. So definitely cover all of that. How to support your how mission. How to support what you're doing. All right. Well, I'd say the easiest and most effective way would be going to both my page and other uh, foundations, like I've mentioned on social media. That, I mean, everyone's got it. It's the easiest way. Facebook, I mean, Mealy Fanatic Foundation, 307 Pursuit. Uh, hunting with heroes wyoming we've all got different links to go to different places on how to donate or how to contact us and and reach out to us and uh, even and just learn more about what we're doing so that's a obviously just a great way to do it and uh, i'd love to sit and talk with you about any questions you might have so you can call me my phone number's on there as well my email's on there you can send a message to my page 
So one thing I will say with Hunting with Heroes is a big part of their thing is they need those donated tags. Yes. I donated a cow elk tag. Now, I was fortunate enough to draw two cow elk tag and a bull tag, and I said, what am I going to do with this third elk tag, right? And I, you know, did the paperwork, transferred over. It's easy. Rowdy's easy to get a hold of and deal with that. But if you're a Wyoming resident and you've got a tag that you're looking at that maybe you've decided that you don't want to fill it or whatever, right? Hunting with Heroes is a great place to... Maybe you're a landowner and you're, you know, a, available to get landowner tags every year. And whether you have them every year and don't fill them or you could get them every year, but you don't get them every year just because you don't want to and because you know you're not going to use them. Those are great things to do to turn around and donate these things back to different organizations. I actually just got a text message today from a buddy from Holy Pursuit Dream Foundation. He helps find kids and he pays for them to come out here and we guide them. And uh, he texted me, he said, I have this awesome kid, he's 24 years old, so he doesn't meet the requirements for being a youth with life-threatening illness, so we can't donate him a tag through his, you know, foundation. So he's texting me, he's like, you know, what can we do? This kid really wants to shoot an elk, he loves Colorado and Wyoming, what can we do? So I'm going to, you know, band around the people I know, and we're going to we're going to come up with a solution to get this kid out hunting. So, I mean, those are the awesome things that, uh, you know, maybe you know of a kid that's under 18 or under 21 that has a life threatening illness and would love to go hunting or fishing. Contact me, contact Holy Pursuit Dream Foundation, Mealy Fanatic Foundation. These are foundations that if we don't have a means to do it this year, we can find someone that does, or we can plan you for the future. And minimally just support, you know, Wyoming fishing game, go get your tags, you know, be, be a voice in your community and, and, you know, be engaged in what the new wildlife laws are, how they're working, what you're seeing, even if you're a landowner, even if you're just driving up and down the road and you've noticed there's always a dead deer right here. Yes. Let's look at putting an overpass in there. Support these foundations. I can't stress that enough. If, if you care about wildlife at all, Put your, put your money where your mouth is. Especially in these times right now. I mean, for Mealy Fanatic Foundation, we've had to cancel our last two years of banquets. And banquets alone are a, a huge percentage of where our money comes from. I mean, what we put into wildlife every year comes from these banquets. So not having those two banquets, you know, these last two years is in, not impacting us. It's impacting the wildlife and what we can contribute to them. And, you know, a lot of our money is piled up between different organizations you know we might raise eighty thousand dollars which you know might seem like a lot of money but when you're talking about building an overpass you're talking about 1.5 million so a lot of our money gets piled into a pool that combines with say Wyoming Game and Fish and different organizations and then we contribute into these 1.5 million dollar projects or whatever it may be you know so if it's five dollars or if it's fifty dollars or if it's just whatever you can do volunteer work we have a lot of things where we tear down fences or rebuild fences and make things more wildlife friendly a lot of those things i mean any means or ways you can help we can find a way for you so that's awesome contact us blake it's been awesome having you on the show and it's uh, been a pleasure blake really appreciate it so again everybody thanks for listening to radcast outdoors if you want more radcast um shows and information go to radcastoutdoors.com you can find us on all your favorite streaming services and we'll be back again soon